This applies to everybody that's sitting uh, in the, the right side in the back and over here on the left side in the back. The last few rows, uh, maybe not so much for the people here in the center section. But this uh, device up here might not be catching all your clicks. If you, if you, uh, you know, I up, I uploaded your uh, roundup uh, yesterday. Your clicking roundup as of the 28th yesterday, and uh, there were some students that were kind of low, and I know some other students in my astronomy class. Said, so Dr. B, I'm there every day, but for some reason I'm not getting a lot. And so this morning we tested it out. And at the far corner of the lecture hall over in classroom building one, uh, his clicker wasn't getting any clicks in. I mean, he stood in one side over here a little bit closer to the front and he was clicking okay. And, but then he went to the very furthest place he could go in the lecture hall and zip zap, it just said no base. So uh, that's why I always say, move your you-know-what to the front. Uh, so you guys in the back, it's your own peril uh, doing that, sitting back there where you're sitting. All right. Uh, we got a lot of stuff to cover today. We're actually uh, going to start dipping into Chapter 7 about waves, hopefully... Uh, by the end of today's lecture. Also, um, some students from the online section and this section uh, alerted me to an error on one of the multiple choice questions in homework 11, I think it was, uh, the comet problem. So, uh, I had the wrong diagram in there, and therefore the correct answer was actually not giving you points, one point. So what I did was for that, and this is for both sections, I, uh, I went in and I changed the correct answer, because the correct answer was on there, it just wasn't, you know, in the, it wasn't giving you points, it was considering that a wrong uh, option. So I made it the correct option and it raised everybody's grade if you voted for that at least once. It dec And I know some of you uh, went back and said, all right, I know this is wrong, but I know that this is going to give me one point. So you voted for that one for your last option, your last attempt. And that's not, it's not going to change that. All right. So nobody's Grade is going to go down. It might go up by one. All right, so just so you know. Now, I want to reinforce the heat melt heat example uh, with you. And uh, we're just going to do another example together. And here's the spec sheet for it. Uh, we're going to heat up uh, 228 grams of water ice uh, up in Greenland. Uh, and it starts out kind of cold, 265 Kelvin. Now, Alexis, that's 8 Kelvin below the freezing point. So if you heat it up by 1 Kelvin, it's still ice. If you heat it up by 2 Kelvins, you know, half a calorie per gram per Kelvin, that's nice. But if you only go up 2 Kelvin, it's still ice. Not until you go up. Now listen to this. You're starting at, at 265. You've got to go up 8 Kelvins. And then, but then you're still ice. You're at the, the melting point. But if you don't add any more energy, it's still going to be ice. And that's because to break the crystalline bonds of water ice or any other solid you know, which might or might not be crystalline, you've got to watch what I'm doing here. Everybody look forward. Come on, look up here. Look what I'm doing. You've got to go into those, those molecules and go like Chuck Norris and bust it up. That's the latent heat of fusion. The amount of energy it takes 
to bust up those at the perfect point. The melting point is the perfect place where that stuff will break. And you want a replay of that? Chuck Norris technique, boom, bam, bim, bow. Okay, you break up those crystalline bonds. And for water, H2O crystals, it's 80 calories for every gram. Now, a gram of water ice has got a zillion, zillion molecules. But, I mean, if you calculate it out, it takes 80 calories to melt it. All right? And, you st and then you still got ice water. You've got ice, liquid ice water. You don't have ice. You have ice water. It's, you know, 32 Fahrenheit, 273 Kelvin. But now it's liquid, and now, and, and now as a liquid, it gets harder to heat up. And why is that? Because the specific heat of liquid water is one. For every calorie you get, it, for every gram and for every Kelvin you want to go up, it takes a full calorie. You know, H2O ice, only half a calorie. You know, so it's like uh, buy one, get one free time if you're ice. But if you're liquid water, just one for one. One gram, one Kelvin, one calorie. All right. Now this one has a final temperature. And I, you know, on that homework, I could set the final temperature to anything that I want. Or the initial temperature, you know, within reason. You know, I can't go to a negative Kelvin number, but you know, uh, but anyway, so I try to make it semi-realistic, uh, semi you know, so up north somewhere, Greenland or down in Antarctica, wherever it happens to be, nice cold ice. And then the final temperature I could set to be, and on this example, it's 307. Now that's, uh, that's like nine, that's almost body temperature, right? So this is warm water. So this is like bath water. But it's not very much. It's only 228 grams. So this is bath water for an ant, as the saying goes. Anyway, so 307 Kelvin. So let's see, from 273 up to 300, that's 27. And then from 300 up to, so a total of 34 Kelvins. So your two delta T's here are 8 and 34. And in between them, you've got the meltdown phase. Okay, 80 calories for every gram. So let's put it all together. Here we go. Uh, latent heat of melting, 80 calories per gram. Ching. All right, now we're going to be due 228 grams worth. So it's going to be 228 times 80. Uh, specific heats. Ching. Bonus time for solid H2O. Regular time for liquid H2O, one calorie per gram per Kelvin. All right. Strategy. And this is probably, uh, you know, where you, you might, you know, this is, the, this is the strategy that will work for any heat melt heat. Heat up the ice from wherever it was to 273. So that means use a specific heat of, of ice, 0 0.50 calories per gram Kelvin. Then melt it all at 273. All right, so that's Chuck Norris time. 80 calories of Chuck Norris action per gram. And you're still at 273. Now, after you get it all melted, the next calorie of heat is going to raise, you know, the temp, start raising the temperature of the liquid. All right. And that's the third part here. You heat the liquid the rest of the way. Uh, oops, this one says 373. This is, that's from last time. So actually, you know what? I think I can change that. Hold on a second. Okay, I can't change that last one. Instead of 373, just write down final temperature, whatever it is. And this one, the final temperature is 307. Okay. So here are the two equations that we use. The heating equation, MC delta T. Not MCAT, which I saw some helpful students type it in last night in discussions. Yeah, MC delta T. And then the Chuck Norris formula is just, you know, however many grams you have times 80 calories per gram. If it's water. Now, if it's copper 
or CO2 or um, any other substance, it might not be 80, it might be, you know, 305.7 calories per gram. But for water, the melting, the bust up that you have to add to it is 80 calories per gram. So here are the specs for this example. Temperatures are 265, 273, and 307. So that means you're starting below the freezing point, melting point. You're finishing it above it, but you're not going above 373. So you're not doing heat, melt, heat, boil. Well, you could do it if you want. If you, you know, if you have a, uh, if you want to convert it all to steam at 380 Kelvin, yeah, you could do that. You know, then you have two phase transitions, but this one's just heat melt heat. Okay, we're going a little bit from a little bit below freezing point to a little bit above. All right. So your delta T's here we are. We just met, we've mentioned them already. First one is eight Kelvin up to the melting point, and then the other one is thirty-four Kelvin up to the final temperature, your target temperature. Okay, so let's, let's plug in time. Let's plug in time at the OK Corral. Okay, first one. Uh, I, mental IQ test question. Have your clickers out ready too because we're going to do a, a version of this in just a minute. Uh, is this solid H2O or liquid H2O? Solid or liquid? Solid. It's solid because it's 0 0.5. I mean, the specific heat tells you that. All right. So you calculate that out. That's 912. Anybody verify me on that, by the way? You got it? OK. Uh, so that brings it up to 273. Now, we're going to do the, the heat up. I mean, physically, this happens third. We're going to do it in second, second calculation. Uh, 228, this is liquid water, so the specific heat is 1, 1 calorie per gram Kelvin. And we're going up to 307, so that's 34 Kelvin above freezing point, melting point, 273 Kelvin. And anybody verify me on that? 7752? Yeah, okay. All right, so that's... Now that's up. Now in between those two, all right. And I see you guys taking really good notes. Excellent. Uh, here's your Chuck Norris time. All right. Uh, two twenty-eight. So for every one of those two twenty-eight grams, I need eighty calories of energy in. You know, from a propane burner or solar radiator, you know, the sunlight will melt it. And you can't get this, you know, sun won't get it up to this temperature. But I mean, you know, theoretically, actually, you know, you could get sunlight if you concentrate its rays. You know, kind of like when you're a little kid in third grade and you take a... Now, I'm not going to look at anybody and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. But I'm just going to look at the ceiling and make a guess that some of you in this class, when you were in like third grade, you had a magnifying glass and you went out on the sidewalk and tried to burn ants with it. And the reason I know that is because I, me and my buddies, when I was in third grade, that's what we did. Anyway, so you could, you could concentrate the sunlight as a heat source, but whatever the heat source, 80 calories for every one of those 228 grams. So the total is 18,240. Uh, does that verify? Okay. So that's your, your melting Chuck Norris process at 273. All right. And then you just add them up. So there's your total energy budget, 26,904. All right. And question in the back. Like, 
No, you have to decide that. You have to read the, you know, I'm going to give you, typically, I'm going to give you a starting temperature and a final temperature. And the final is going to be above, you know, so here's the melting point. And the final is going to be above it. And the initial is going to be below it. And then you got to figure out your delta T here and then your delta T over here. But, I mean, it's not that hard. If you remember the freezing point, you're good. And you'll always, and just so you know, on an exam, you'll always have a table of freezing points, specific heats, everything like that. I mean, it's possible to remember water because uh, it's pretty simple, but I usually put water in the table too. So there might be, and I showed you that last time, you know, a couple metals maybe, or, you know, some kind of a other solid. All right, so now get your clickers out. Let's do a clicker question together. Turn the lights up, please. Uh, and this one, you're, it's not multiple choice this time. It's calculation all the way. All right, so here we go. All right. You've got 120 grams, so a little bit less. Uh, and... All right, there's your starting temperature, 250. Okay, figure out your delta T from that. And there's your final temperature, 290. Figure out your second delta T from that uh, and go to town. And round it off to the nearest whole number of calories. And type that in and hit the send key. All right, and just, and as always, uh, consult with your neighbor Consult with your friend and talk things over. Let's see what you guys can do. But so far, nobody's got an answer in. Good. You're working. I could take a little break. Thank you. 
Darian, what's your office hour? Friday? Uh, 11 to 12. 11 to 12, okay. Okay, one minute. Oh my goodness. All right, let's talk again about Max Planck. Now, we, I think we talked about him a little bit last time. And he is uh, the German physicist um, who uh, over 100 years ago, so let's see, about 1898 is when he started working on this stuff. So what is that? 120 years ago, um, he was working on why things produce uh, light electromagnetic radiation in the proportions that they're observed and measured to produce. Um, and he, you know, to understand real physical bodies, he invented this concept of a black body. In other words, um, a perfect absorber of radiation so it doesn't reflect anything. Okay, so that means it's black but also a perfect emitter of radiation. So, okay, for that reason, if you heat it up, it, it will um, emit radiation. And so in about 1900, he wrote a new theory of black body radiation. Because what you do is in the lab, and this is something that I've done in the lab, you make a little furnace, you know, a ceramic or, or whatever, and you heat it up, 
and you get it heated up evenly in all corners and then you open up a little window in it and then you measure the strength of each wavelength of light coming out of that little window. And when I did it, our furnace was about, mm, about the size of two or three toasters. And it was really hot. And we had, you know, photo uh, measurement uh, devices to measure it. And it, it was perfect. I mean, it, we got the same uh, spectrum that he predicted. So the way that he developed his theory was to say that all the little electrons all the little electric charges are oscillating periodic motion um, and the quantum of energy, uh, which he called H, it's actually a quantum of angular momentum. Uh, and he, he said every oscillator that's producing electromagnetic radiation is quantized by that constant. And here is um, what the black body spectra look like. Now, these are theoretical curves. But if you make a furnace like I described a few minutes ago, um, and, uh, and, you know, you measure, you know, wavelength by wavelength, and you can see down here on the bottom, get my cursor over here. Come on, cursor. All right. Down here on the bottom, it's the wavelength in nanometers. Go ahead and write that. It starts at zero over here and it goes up to about 2,000. And then the vertical scale is, uh, is energy, it's kilojoules per nanometer, okay? And that's kind of an idealized measure, but basically that's how much, how much energy is going out at each wavelength, all right? And these are the temperatures. So this is these temperature settings. This is the this is what you control with your fur. You know, so you you turn up the electrical power going into your electrical furnace in the lab. You know, that's how we did it, and we control the temperature that way. And then you measure it, and you read off the temperature. Okay, uh, five thousand Kelvin. You know, four thousand. You know, whatever the temperature happens to be. And then you go and you, you break down, you know, you send the light. The light comes out of the furnace. You break it up with a diffraction grating or a prism or something. And then you measure the intensity of each color. And that's what this graph shows. All right. So the vertical axis is brightness. Horizontal axis is wavelength in nanometers. Uh, and, hey, you guys, uh, the visible um, band of wave of uh, of light is from 400 to 700 nanometers. Okay, now this graph goes all the way from zero to 2,000. So if you put a bunch of tick marks on there, you can go. You know, they've got a big one there for 500, another big one for 1,000. Uh, so if you go in between there, you can indicate 400, 500, 600, 700, uh, and that's the band for visible light. So visible light is approximately 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers, okay? And notice that the peak intensity is changing with temperature. The peak, the very top of each of these spectra the way, in other words, the, the top of the spectrum, we're, we're the top of the hill, that's the wavelength at which most energy is coming out. Right? Notice that, that the top of the hill, as the energy decreases, the top of the hill shifts to the right slightly, and it gets smaller. The hill gets smaller, and the top of the hill moves to the right. Question? Okay, the question is, how is the rest of this graph credible if, if we can only see uh, up to 700 nanometers, between 400 and 700 nanometers? And the answer to that is, 
We use other things. To, we don't use our eyes to measure all this. In fact, we don't use to, to measure the intensity to get a number that you can graph. You don't use your eyes at all. Use like a photometer, just like your camera. You know, you know how it'll do automatic flash if the light is low? That's a photometer in there, right? It, it tests the, the ambient light. If it's too low, it flashes. If it's high enough, it doesn't flash. So yeah, just different. And there's optics and meters for infrared. Just think about guys in the army. You know, they use infrared goggles to see in the nights. Same thing. And ultraviolet, we can, do, we can do all kinds of different wavelengths. You know, sometimes it's harder, but yeah, we can bag all these. It's not hard. I mean, sometimes it's hard, but it's, it's doable. I'll put it that way. All right. So these are also, just so you know, these are the temperatures that we see on the surfaces of many stars. When you look at in the universe, you know, if you, if you know your constellation, for instance, Orion, there's a big, bright red star in Orion called Betelgeuse. And that has a temperature uh, down here, uh, right about here. It's in the 3500s for Betelgeuse. So Betelgeuse, its peak intensity is not even visible. It's infrared. Everything to the right of this green box is infrared. Everything to the left of it is, in, is ultraviolet and then x-ray. All right. Now, what Planck figured out, nobody could, everybody was measuring this 120 years ago, but nobody knew how to make F equals MA work to explain this. You know, a lot of things in life, a lot of things that are measurable, physically measurable, if you know a little bit of F equals MA, you know, like pressure in a gas, temperature in a gas, if you know a little bit of F equals MA and some trig and a little calculus, you can figure out, okay, the average kinetic energy, one half MV squared average, is proportional directly to the Kelvin temperature. But nobody could figure this out until um, Planck invented quantization. He invented the whole idea of quantization. So only constant H could render the shape of these spectra. You know, and the, the way it worked is there was a theory for the left-hand side of this where, where the hill is rising up, but they couldn't, get, they couldn't inject any F equals MA concepts to make it curve back down. You know, that model was fine for the, the, the hill, the left side of the hill. And then another guy said, well, what if we do this theory? And, you know, he said he came up with another theory, and that explains the downhill side, the right side of each of these hills. But it doesn't, you know, when it gets to smaller, smaller wavelengths, it just keeps going up. It doesn't fall back down like, these, like they were actually observing. So what Planck did was he said, all right, if you quantize those oscillations of the electromagnetic field, this thing will fold right back down, just like observation. And that is actually um, an H, Planck's constant H, it's a quantum, it is the master constant. Go ahead and write that down in your notes. You know, just like in the Lord of the Rings, the one ring to rule them all. Planck's constant is the one constant that rules, rules them all. It is involved in every physical process at some level. You know, gravitation doesn't have anything to do with electromagnetic intensity. So all the, you know, all the strength of the electron, it doesn't, it doesn't enter into gravitational um, theory and vice versa. The mass, I mean, it, it kind of does when the mass, when, you, when you're doing F equals MA and stuff, but... Uh, but, uh, but Planck's constant, it's in everything. It's the one constant that rules them all. And this is why the whole theory of energy in the electromagnetic field is in this picture. 
Look at this picture. It's a, a, a fire breather. Or what, is that what they call them? A fire breather? A fire eater. Or a fire breather. You know, some guy, he gets a little kerosene in his mouth, and then he blurts it out, and then he torches it off, you know, like, like this guy. You know, you've got to have a little hand torch of some kind. Because can't, it can't be in your mouth so hot that it's burning. You know, I wouldn't want to do it. I mean, put kerosene in your mouth, but you know, that's what these guys do. Uh, anyways, this picture um, shows you a very bright fireball. And if you were to put the light from that fireball into a diffraction grating, break up all the spectrum into the whole color, the, the whole rainbow, and then measure the intensity at each green, you know, each yellow, each, you know, each color in the rainbow, um, it would look exactly like those spectra that, you know, with the, the big hill in the middle and then, you know, gradually sloping back down, the Planck spectra. And that is significant for heat transport. So let's take a look at the three modes of heat transport. First one is conduction. And this picture here of this fire eater is perfect. To conduct heat into anything, you have to have some kind of physical contact of hot with cold. All right? So when you put an ice cube in your hand, it starts to melt. And that's because your hand is hot and your, the ice cube is cold. So energy goes into the ice cube, melts some of it, and it runs down as, as water. It melts. Okay, same thing here. This guy's got coolish liquid kerosene in his mouth. He blurts it out into a, a little cloud and then torches it off with that little hand torch. Okay? And so this conduction, we say that heat flows into the cooler object relatively easier, or relatively easily, right? And it raises the temperature of that cooler object. Uh, so this guy's got it, and, and that's how this guy does his, his thing, all right? So these pictures, they show conduction, all right? Um, now, here's a counterexample to conduction. If you think about it, this should make sense. There are some substances that don't conduct thermal energy. Okay, and those are what we call insulators. Okay? So, uh, you know what a good insulator is? Air. Air doesn't conduct for beans. And that's why if you go up north in the winter, you, you know, if you're going way up north, like to New Hampshire or something, you want to have a down jacket, you know, with a nice thick hood. And down, the way goose down works, all those little feathers, it's not the feathers per se, it's the, the fact that the feathers trap air inside the, the lining of the coat. And that, no, that, um, that air is what prevents heat from leaving your body and going out. I mean, eventually you'll, you'll cool off, but it's a lot slower. And so, now another kind of heat transport is called convection. And this is another picture. Here's another guy. And notice he's got two torches in his left and right hand. And that thing's blazing upward. Now, convection is bulk motion of the fireball. All right, he blasts it out. He uses conduction to ignite it. And then once it's ignited, it's hot and it moves upward. You know, so he's, he's blurting it out of his mouth kind of upward instead of downward. Because if he, if he did it downward, I mean, he could do it. But then it, was, it would burn his toes and stuff like that. So you don't want that. You don't want to burn your toes off. Okay, so you want it to red, and then everybody goes, ooh, cool, neat. Conduction and convection are related because if, if, if a substance doesn't 
conduct well, like air, um, then you can get bulk motion because the hotter stuff is usually less dense. And just like bubbles of, you know, like a scuba diver and he breathes out and the bubbles bubble up to the surface, okay, and those bubbles rise because they're buoyant. They're less dense than the water in, in, in the ocean. Same thing here. That fireball is less dense than the surrounding air. Now, it's heating up the surrounding air, but not very quickly, right? So it rises, it transports the fireball vertically from point A to point B. So that counts as a transport method, right? Convection. And so it's, it's basically buoyancy. All right, now it won't work very good in a solid, but for a liquid or a gas, oh uh, yeah, uh, there's plenty of buoyancy opportunities. All right, now thunderstorms are convection systems. Boiling water on the stove is a convection system. All right. You, know, you see the, the water kind of rolls and it rises in the center and it falls down along the edges. Uh, and you, know, you get a nice rolling boil. That's a convection system. Hurricanes are ginormous and self-organizing convection systems. But here's another one that you may not know about, the mantle of the earth. It's not very good of, as a heat conductor. And so it does have convection if the conditions are right. And one of the places where there is convection in the mantle of the earth, um, and you can see the effects of it easily, is out in Yellowstone. You know, out in the, the Rocky Mountains. Here's a, out here in, it's Yellowstone National Park approximately. Now, underneath that, you know, we have all those geysers, and itself, Yellowstone is a gigantic, what is that? Really? Uh, Yellowstone, uh, they have geysers, and Yellowstone itself is a gigantic volcano that blew its top off, you know, some, you know, a million years ago or something like that, and greased all kinds of uh, animals in all over North America uh, with the, you know, the fallout, the ash fallout and stuff. But it's, it's actually the, the crater left behind by this huge super volcano eruption. Now, here's what it looks like if you look under the earth. I want you to look at this. So go ahead and write down Yellowstone mantle plume. And I don't think you can make a sketch of this, but definitely look at it. All right, let's take a look at this. Everywhere it's red here, this, this key down here tells you the speed of seismic waves. They're called P waves, okay? And where it's red, that means it's slower than usual. Where it's blue, that means it's a little bit faster than usual, All right? So right in the red part here, this kind of, this kind of long spindly thing, and it's really red up here, uh, that means that uh, the seismic waves go through there, you know, and they could set up a couple seismometers around Yellowstone and, you know, they could triangulate in and figure out, yeah, this is where the seismic waves slow down, right here, okay? And then here's another cross-sectional view, uh, right here. And so where the, the seismic waves slow down, that means it's a little bit more fluid. Seismic waves, it's kind of like, uh, they're kind of like sound waves. I mean, they're pressure waves. And if you, if you think about it, you know, you see, see sometimes in a movie, you know, somebody will listen to the railroad tracks and the, they hear a train coming, you know, and, um, and that's because sound travels through metal very rapidly, much more rapidly than it travels through air. 
Air is a fluid. It's not rigid at all. Steel railroad tracks are very rigid. That's, that's how they're made. They're made to be rigid. So they conduct sound very quickly. The speed of sound in steel is very high relative to the speed of sound in air. Now, speed of sound in air is pretty fast, but it's really fast in uh, steel, any kind of metal, all right? And the difference is because of the rigidity. So here, the where you see this red stuff, that means the mantle is less rigid. That means it's more melty, all right? And this picture here is hundreds of miles across. It's a cross-sectional view right below Yellowstone, and it is from northwest to southeast. And then the second one is, is the opposite direction, from northeast up here to southwest. So they took two cross-sectional views, and you can see the Yellowstone mantle plume. And what that is, it's a blob of of uh, molten rock that's blooping vertically, it's convecting up through the mantle of the earth, okay? It's a convection plume. And it has all these, you know, you know all, the guy, all the thermal features in Yellowstone. And I used to live, you know, when I went to grad school in Montana, out in Bozeman, Montana, that's just to the north of this place. And there's all kinds of thermal, f it's, it's actually kind of cool, you live out there. You know, see here in Florida, we don't even have any mountains. We hardly even have any hills. But out there, if, you know, there's all kinds of hot springs. So if you go up in the mountains, there's cool mountain streams, you know, ice cold. But then if you're, in, if you're camping in an area near where there's a hot spring, you can dip into the cold creek and then dip into the hot spring. It's like taking a sauna, only it's 20 times better. Anyway, so there's all that kind of cool stuff out there in the Yellowstone area. So uh, southwestern Montana, uh, northwestern uh, Wyoming and stuff. It's very cool. Okay, Planck's constant radiation, electromagnetic radiation. Now here's some of the specs. The momentum and kinetic energy is carried away by photons of light. So that, that fireball, it wasn't very effective. I mean, it was losing energy, and it was cooling off by radiative transport. But it wasn't a big effect. The main effect is convection for those fireballs. But, the, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, the photons of light are carrying momentum and kinetic energy away from uh, the fireball, away from any hot object, all right? The sun, I mean, everything that we get from the sun, pretty much everything, is photons of light, you know, in, including ultraviolet and infrared. So it could be visible light. Um, it could be um, ultraviolet, infrared. It could be x-rays. I mean, some stars put out a lot of x-rays. The sun does it. The sun puts out some x-rays, but not a whole lot. Now, if the material absorbs it, it'll heat up. You know, those photons will deposit momentum and kinetic energy. And guess what? That raises the average kinetic energy of whatever absorbs it. And therefore, the average kinetic energy goes up. That means the temperature goes up. All right? Now, your skin cells stop ultraviolet. That's what gives you sunburn. And my wonderful students, I want everybody in here to be very careful. Boy, you guys are not listening. The sunburn that you have this year can turn to cancer 30 years from now. And so you don't want that. So you have to be very careful about getting... Why are you laughing about cancer? You're watching a movie or something? All right, so, uh, uh, yeah, astronauts, they need to shield themselves from sunlight. Now, here's the, the actual number 
uh, of joules per second that hits the top of the Earth's atmosphere. Square meter for square meter, it's about 1370. Right, so that's a lot of uh, joules per second. You know, a, 13, a joule per second is a watt, so that's 1370 watts, which is enough to power a hair dryer. I mean, so a square meter about this wide, about this tall, catches about 1370 watts of solar energy at the top of the atmosphere, all right? So that means that spacecraft and satellites have to defeat that, and a lot of times they do it by coating themselves in a reflective, sometimes they use white paint, and sometimes they use like reflective mylar uh, to reflect, uh, this, it just bounce it back off. I mean, it, it doesn't bounce 100%, but it bounces a lot off. Uh, now, uh, here's a picture of one of the Apollo astronauts, and up there on the moon, they had to, they have the, the fanciest uh, gold coating on their visor, uh, and that's basically to protect their faces and their eyes, because there's no atmosphere on the moon. I mean, here, a lot of, uh, the, a lot of the ultraviolet is blocked by the atmosphere, not all of it, but a, a good bunch of it. Uh, but up there, no, they get everything. Everything the sun produces hits the surface of the moon, so they have to be protected for that. Uh, now, the opposite case is a rooftop collector, which you sometimes see on houses, you know, for uh, hot water systems and stuff. Those are optimized. They want to get as much solar energy as possible. So, uh, so this, this whole idea of radiant energy transport, here's another... Um, radiant energy system, uh, SR-71 Blackbird, it goes so fast that if it's, if it's fairly lowish in the atmosphere, where the atmosphere is fairly thick, the leading edges of these things will, will uh, glow red, they say. So, um, so that's heat transport. Now, um, here's another concept that I want to go through with you and that is the phase transition uh, from solid to gas. And that's called sublimation. Now, here's a diagram similar to what's in our textbook. Uh, and we know that, you know, from, from gas to liquid, from liquid to gas, that's vaporization, condensation. Uh, from liquid to solid, solid to liquid, that's melting or freezing. Okay. And water gives you good examples of that. Now, uh, from gaseous to solid is a little bit trickier. You can do it with water, but CO2, dry ice, is the, uh, is the classic example of that phase transition. So uh, into a high energy from a low energy state, uh, that's called uh, sublimation. And uh, dry ice does it. That's why they call it dry ice. It, it goes to a higher energy state uh, under the uh, pressure conditions that we experience here at the surface of the Earth. Um, it, it doesn't admit, it's, it's, it's too low energy to go into the liquid phase. It'll go straight to gas, right? And... Uh, now, the, the idea of going from gas to solid, that's what we call um, epitaxy or, or deposition. And a lot of your electronics are made with uh, epitaxy. They deposit a layer of silicone, silicon and uh, germanium, different um, substances in layers, and then they carve layers out and stuff, and uh, they create electronics and stuff. It's, Pretty, diff pretty difficult to do. Um, now, I want to talk about the ambient pressure effects on these phase transitions. And here's a picture of some dry ice. And dry ice can become wet ice, but only in high pressure environments. And so I want to talk a little bit about pressure um, in order to, uh, so this is a, kind of a new topic here. Um, I want to talk about pressure uh, so that you can get a handle on 
what dry ice does. So in the English system, the unit of pressure is pounds per square inch, PSI. So for instance, a scuba tank uh, might be filled up to high pressure, 3,000 PSI. In the metric system, it's uh, newtons per square meter of pressure. So that's the amount of force being deposited into the wall for every square meter by zillions of little molecules and atoms of a gas. Now, a newton per square meter is also known as a Pascal. Symbol is PA, capital P, and that's named after a French scientist named Blaise Pascal. Now, another unit of measurement that's considered metric is the bar, and that's 100,000 Pascals because uh, atmospheric pressure at sea level on a fair day is just about a um, hundred thousand pascals. So a um, thousand and thirteen point two five millibars is considered fair weather. Now Hurricane Patricia, for instance, was about the central pressure. You know how when you're listening to the Weather Channel and they're talking about a hurricane, well the central pressure is eight hundred eighty millibars. So they're talking about bars, and actually millibars, not bars. Um, and so there's 1,013 millibars uh, for a normal everyday atmospheric pressure. 101,325 pascals, so that's the conversion there. Uh, and in the English system, PSI, it's about 15, 14.7 PSI. So a scuba tank is going to be, uh, you know, several hundred atmospheres of pressure. And if you're going down deep, you have to have pressurized air. Otherwise, it won't go into your lungs. Uh, raise your hand if you are a scuba diver. Anybody? Okay. And so you know that you have to, especially the deeper you go, you have to have pressurized air, and it depends... It controls how long you can stay under and everything like that. Another uh, common thing that you see on the Weather Channel is inches of mercury. Uh, and 29.92 is considered fair weather at sea level. Uh, and that's the uh, barometric column. Uh, it's kind of an archaic measure. We don't really use those barometers anymore. We have other ways to measure the pressure, but it's still... Um, a term of art. Now that's pressure, very basic pressure concepts there. And now we can take a look at this diagram. This is um, a pressure temperature diagram uh, for carbon dioxide. Now look at this. Try to draw this the solid line here. It's kind of a crooked sideways Y. Right now this point right here where the three parts of the Y join together, that's known as the triple point. That's the temperature and pressure combination where CO2 can, is perfectly happy to be a gas, a liquid, or a solid. Now, up in, the, the, in between the, the two uprights of this crooked Y, that's the liquid state. To the left of the Y is the solid state. And to the right of the Y is the gaseous state. All right? Now, one atmosphere is right down here. All right? So now that's where we are. So the triple point is way above us, okay? Up here at 510 kilopascals. That's about five atmospheres. All right? So we... You know, we're never going to be in a place where you're going to see wet CO2 ice. You know, we're down here at about one atmosphere, plus or minus a few millibars. Um, so it's always going to be dry ice for us. So this is what we see, sublimation. All right, so make a kind of a biggish arrow across that boundary. Now that's on this crookedy Y kind of tilted to the side, that's the bottom part of the Y. All right? Now the two branches of the Y tilt, kind of tilted over. Um, 
And there's the triple point. Now, here's solid to liquid. Now, this is what we have every day for H2O ice. But CO2 ice, no way. You gotta be way up there to go from solid to a liquid. So this is where puddles are. And put, you know, even we could do it in the lab, but you, you know, we can't live under these conditions. Okay? Yeah, so we can do this artificially. All right, so this is puddles. This is melting from solid to liquid. Now with H2O ice, no problema. CO2 ice, not so hot. All right? And so that's the melting phase transition. And so as I mentioned um, up there, and, and notice where 273 is. 270, you know, if this room were 273 Kelvin, we'd be freezing our you-know-what's off. That's zero uh, Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, and that's, I don't know, what is that, right about in here somewhere? All right, so that triple point is, is really cold and high pressure, so it is not going to be available to us. Now, uh, we're going to dismiss in a minute, but before we do, I want you to take a look at this picture. Oh, my goodness. This is an actual person here. It's a guy on a surfboard. Now, look at how small he is. Let's say he's six feet tall. And look how big that wave is compared to him. That's over in Portugal, in a place over in Portugal. Now, what I want you to do over the weekend is skim chapter 7 on waves. And, uh, and that's all your homework. Just skim chapter 7. You're dismissed. I'll see you on uh, Tuesday next week.